what I recommend to parents. Raise your kids to be proud of who they are. Who they are. Be proud of both their cultures, their heritages, their ethnicities, and know who they are and know that none of those things define them. So you know I left DC to get away from the weather and you? Oh yeah, here's my imaginary umbrella, by the way. And now you have me dealing with both. I'm telling you, man, you cannot escape us, man. You can't escape hometown, dude. I know. Appreciate you coming back over here, man. I know you tore it up last night at the Kennedy Center with, with Moz. How was the show? It was good. It was you like coming show. back home? You know, I like coming back home now. DC hasn't always been so supportive. And now it's the support is overwhelming and it's great. So now it's great. But I remember there wasn't a time, there was a time where it wasn't so so great to, to come back home sometimes. You know, they always say that, you know, you don't appreciate somebody until they leave and oh. that's what's happened to you. But that was a great move that you made a few years ago for your career. A few just years, it's like, it's been like eight years. I feel like it has been eight years. It has. But let's go back more than eight years. For those that don't know Tehran, tell them a little bit about, you know, where were you born and raised, your family I'm, background. I'm a DC kid. Born and raised DC, outside DC in Fairfax County as well. Um, my family background, the big, the big hoopla, of course. I'm half Persian, half black. So Dude, I knew Persian. you were something black. Yeah, <laughs> my dad's Persian, my dad, my mom's black, and that. And, and the thing about it is, it's so interesting to me how now that's become a conversation. When I first started speaking about it, people actually used to get upset about it and talk to me and like think it was weird that I cared about my heritage. You know, people would really get upset. There was specifically- You mean specifically about like the black part of it? About, no, yeah. just being like, oh, why are you so loud about being black and Persian? It's not oh, special. Right. There's not many of us. And yeah. if you're Persian, there are people who join their Iranian Heritage Club where there was no Iranian African American Heritage Club. Yeah. So I created one, you know? Right. So it's a very similar thing. And I, I speak about it because it's not just about being Iranian and, and, and black. It's not about the fact that you mix two cultures that generally do not really mix, but it's also about being mixed in general, about learning where to fit in and being proud of yourself, your inner self for everyone. Like it's about, it's honestly, my number one thing about my brand is self-love. If you don't, if you can't tell, I love me. I'm my favorite brand and I want everyone to be their favorite brand. And you know what, you say self-love and self-love is very popular now. I mean, meaning like people talk about it, exactly. but definitely when you, when you were growing up, there wasn't so much or so much it was, People and thought it was being cocky or yeah. arrogant yeah. or all yeah. these things. It's no, it's just love yourself. And, and the thing about it is I can love myself and love you too. It's okay. Exactly. Because I love me doesn't mean that I look down on you. I want you to be amazing too. Uh, people don't often see that. I want everyone to be stars. If you ever look up in the night sky and there's one or two stars, you don't look up again. You don't look up. It doesn't, it's not important. But when it's full of stars, that's when you look up in awe. That's how I feel about everybody. Everyone can be a star. Everyone can be the star of at least their own movie. Not everyone needs to be famous, but you can star in your own movie. Inspire to be the best you in whatever it is that you want to do. So tell me, when you were growing up and having such two different type of backgrounds like you had the, you had the complete spectrum you know yeah. um how how I, I know i know that you embrace it now and you embrace it very very early in your in your life but what was it difficult at a certain point at a younger age where you're like kind of torn where you're trying to figure out where to fit it because that's hard i mean it was difficult as an adult it was difficult uh just everyone telling you you're not enough of the other thing yeah all the time or that you're more one thing than the other not realizing you're just being yourself so that's why I learned, thankfully, at a young age to just be comfortable with myself. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, just because you, you get older or you put on this front, that's just the front. Like the truth is, we all wanna fit in somewhere. And where do you fit in when you're mixed? Where do you fit in, especially when you're part of two minorities of minorities, yeah. right? Where do you fit in? And a lot of, I've, I've felt a lot of resistance from the Iranian community at times where I would speak about things that were true and they wouldn't want me to talk about those things as if they were secrets, the dirty little secrets. Like having a family and you have an alcoholic family member and don't talk about it. Yeah. But that's how you heal is talking about it. 
And that's what I do with my comedy, is I talk about things that are real, and I, it's like a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. So was there somebody that kind of gave you that extra like confidence and be like, listen, man, Taron, just be comfortable who you are, embrace the both sides, or was it just you through trial and error and hurt that you kind of found it? What was it? Actually, I'm gonna tell you specifically what it was. At, I, I remember the day. It was, I was, I was like five years old, and I was, when I was growing up, being mixed was not a thing yet. People really weren't mixed. So now we have all of, a lot of us mixed people are grown up, the Drakes and myself. But honestly, mixing is very relatively new. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was illegal up to a point. Mm -hmm. uh, for both cultures, yeah, when you think all, about it. Not, I'm not even talking about, I'm talking about legally, it was illegal yeah. to mix. Virginia didn't have a law until the 70s. Like, it was, a, it was against the law. So to, to marry outside the to, race, to be a black person ma married with a oh, white right. person yeah, or okay. anything. Yeah. So being mixed wasn't common. And growing up, and now you see mixed people everywhere. And growing up, uh, it wasn't common. People didn't know to, know or understand so, it. So what happened? What was in the fifth? Grade? I was when I was five. No, I wasn't even in the fifth grade. Wow. I was five years wow. old. I was at kindergarten, and my mom used to pick me up all the time. But on this particular day, my dad, my bubba, was coming to pick me up and the teachers could not comprehend that this person was my parent. Oh. They could not comprehend they that. Security. They were, exactly, they were just being very vigilant against my bubba picking me up. Yeah. And my bubba just, and I remember at five feeling confused or shame or something, and my bubba, you know, you know how Persian parents are, he just pushed through and like picked me up. I was like, you know, Pesada Mounted, this is my son, and walked out, and I felt so much love in that moment that I, I nice. at that moment, realized I'm just loved. I'm just gonna be myself. It, it doesn't matter. And none of this matters. So, and from then on, I, I became a person who, who was a voice for these particular situations and this group of people and myself. Yeah. So when you say voice and how you apparently picked it up at a much younger age than I ever would have thought that you would, was that voice correlated with being on stage and being a comedian or just being comedic? Was that kind of like a defense mechanism or was that like you knew who you were from a very young age and you were destined and you wanted to kind of almost just project a lot of this love out to kind of combat this kind of stuff that you're dealing with? You know, maybe being funny or having a sense of humor comes with that kind of hurt in a way where it becomes your natural protection but for me it, it was really just an onset of I had these thoughts that a lot of people who were my peers did not have. I had awareness that a lot of my peers did not have so I found that if I masked it with humor that it would be easier for them to accept or understand or not get so upset mm -hmm. uh, and, and this continued into my into my adulthood. I actually went to University of Maryland one time and they had this Persian studies class. There was a, a, a professor there invited me to come speak. And there's this Persian studies class. Most of the students were Persians, probably looking for an easy A, but there were a couple non-Persians and there were Persian kids there that were mixed also. Uh, there was at least five Persian kids there that were also mixed. And I was speaking about my experiences and a, and a couple students who were full Persian were so upset. They're like, Persians aren't racist. You need to stop saying that. You're making this up. You don't know, it's not. And the Persian kids who were mixed were like, no, I've been through this. Mm. I've lived through this. And I, and I said purely and simply, I was like, you know, we didn't call each other and say, we're gonna make this up to hurt you. Yeah. We're letting you know what's going on. So maybe you're the outlier and you don't see it, but we see a lot of other things. So be aware of it. Right. It's an awareness. So you, you spoke obviously about how your father kind of had this very, um, powerful moments when you were five years old. Yeah. If you had to give any advice to parents that have uh, biracial children, is there any advice that you can give them to make sure that, because not everybody has the mental fortitude that you have, man. I mean, I know I know you as a very strong-minded individual, yeah, but- I'm stubborn. But, but you That's also, nice for saying stubborn, by the yeah, way. But there's also a lot of kids who, I mean, dude, depression, mental health, all these issues. So is what, what, what would you do? Kids. Yeah, so what would you and recommend? I actually, I'm gonna tell you a story. There's this video that's out, and I met with this mother, and her son was unfortunately shot by the police. Her son was mixed black and white. Uh, her son's father had died. And so she raised her son with her white family. Even though he was a person of color, she raised him uh, with her, her white family. Mm -hmm. So one day, 
uh, when he was 19, he gets pulled over by the police. And they play the tape of the police and it's just a regular conversation that you would think a white kid would have with a police officer. Except the only difference is, he was a black kid. And her regret is, I never, all the things I taught him, I never taught him that he was black. Meaning I never explained the difference and he didn't know. And unfortunately, he did die. And then they play another tape of an, the same officer pulling someone else over, very similar situation, white kid, and the kid, of course, getting off with a warning. Right. And they're currently and embroiled. And unfortunately, it's a reality. Like it's unfortunate. And that's, this isn't, oh, all police are horrible. This, that's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah. I'm saying be aware of the situations where it does happen. So, so it's what, the same thing I do. So what, what do you recommend to parents? I mean, this, is is what I, this is what I recommend to parents. Raise your kids to be proud of who they are. Who they are. Be proud of both their cultures, their heritages, their ethnicities, and know who they are and know that none of those things define them. They are themselves and it's okay. I love it. Yeah, I mean, because we can't really control how other kids are, you know, you can't really control how the teachers behave, but there is something that happens under the roof uh, of a house that can hopefully give children the strength and confidence that they need. All right, so now we're gonna get to you a little bit older. How would uh, school teachers in your high school? Oh, I was a piece of shit. <laughs> I, I've been a piece of shit since I was a kid. So nothing has changed? Yet? Listen, nothing, not only has it not changed, I remember in second grade, I had a teacher, Miss Wilson. Miss Wilson was the oldest teacher at our school. And she'd been teaching there for, let's say 30 years or something like that. She'd been teaching at this elementary school for 30 some years. And she was the oldest, physically the oldest teacher at the school. And one time, and I would always correct her. I would always correct something. I would, I would argue with her, I would speak up. So one time in class, she was doing a problem, a math problem on the board. And I was like, that's wrong. And she was like, oh, that's not wrong. And we argued. And then she went and I gave her the right answer. And she went into the back of the book where it had the answers. And I was right. Oh, and, I, and she was like, well, we're going to, I was like, no, look, look in the, and I went and I was like, look. And she was like, you're an asshole in front of the class. And then she and got frazzled. I was in second grade. And she walked out of the class, right? The counselor comes in and like calms the class down because all the kids are, oh, you know, asshole yeah. was such a big deal back when we were in second grade, yeah. you know? I think it's so, so nice. no, no, you know, kids now, nowadays, you can just click porn. <laughs> like it's not a big deal, you know what I'm saying? We had to put in work, okay? So called me an asshole, leaves. So my, so the principal calls my, my parents who've been accustomed to the principal at this point yeah. and comes in and is my, the principal's trying to explain to my Persian Bubba that the teacher called me an asshole and my Bubba's getting mad at me like, what did Ted on do? And, I, and she's like, well, the teacher said something obscene, obtuse, like he doesn't understand. Like the teacher called your son an asshole. And he's like, the teacher called Ted on an asshole? Yeah, because he's asshole. He's always correcting us. Like he's like well, so they the principal. Today. They bonded over me. But yeah, I've always been I've always been like loud and extra. But thankfully, I've always been uh, academically doing well. I've academically done well. Which you'll note, actually, a lot of comedians are very intelligent people. Oh, of course. Yeah, you're an anomaly, dude. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> a lot of comedians are intelligent people and. Oh, of course. You know, good comedians are extremely yeah. intelligent. But that's the thing about comedy, right? So good comedy makes you laugh, but great comedy makes you think. Yeah. And so it's a lot of these people who would, in any other time period in the world, be philosophers, become comedians. Even if you think about it, who makes you think more about politics than Jon Stewart or Trevor Noah? They're just comedians. Right. Uh, about family, you know, these sitcoms, they're comedians. Seinfeld is a comedian, yeah. you know? So w Tiffany Haddish, Wanda Sykes, they're comedians and yet they make us think and they make us understand. Dave Chappelle, who's brilliant, is a comedian. So you're mentioning all these comedians. I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Top three comedians of all time. Of all time? For you. Dave Chappelle, number one, hands down. And the rest are all, it's tough. I have biases towards Maz, Jabrani, and Maximini oh, because wow. they're people who are in my life. So, so, so but I've seen a lot of good comedians. You put Dave Chappelle on, on his own he's, little pedestal. Why, why Dave Chappelle? Dave Chappelle does things that are uncomfortable. He says things that are, are tough. He's true to himself. Mm -hmm. He is brilliant. He has ideas that far exceed what you would think of as just normal comedy. And the way he puts it together is brilliant. 
a lot of people get offended, yeah. but he's telling his truth. Right. So you say offended, and this is gonna be a nice segue because Dave Chappelle is one of those uh, polarizing, polarizing sure. uh, comedians. And as you know, the last few years, there's a lot more sensitivity in what people are saying, especially comedians. And it's, I feel like it's really put comedians in a very, between a hard place and a rock because like they want to continue to push the envelope. They want to continue to be funny. They want to continue to speak well, the truth. that's our job. Yeah. That's out, so what, our what, job. Do you, what do you think about the culture of what you guys, or the environment that you guys are living in? Are you, are you now consciously thinking about what to say and what not to say? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of comedians do. I am in a boat right now where I don't need to. Okay. But maybe one day, there are times where I've said things that have offended people. Yeah. I will say this, and this goes out to the audience. Just because you're offended, doesn't mean you're right. Being offended is easy, it's feelings. Do you want people to bury their thoughts, hide their true sensations and emotions and experiences? Just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. However, this goes out to the comedians. Just because you're offensive, doesn't mean you're right either. Or funny. Exactly, or funny. And that is the true root of a lot of things, is here's my suggestion to comedians, and I'm taking this myself. If you're saying something that's offensive, then maybe you didn't say it funny enough, or it wasn't funny enough, or it's low-hanging fruit. So, speaking of offensive, I forgot his name, maybe you know, but just a couple days ago, a comedian made a really Ari good Shafir. taste. Yeah. Ari Shafir made a Kobe Bryant, rest in peace. Yeah. He made a video about Kobe Bryant, and it was very, it was, it was very untimely. If you know anything about Ari Shafir, you know that that's his style of comedy. It's what he does. And he, he made a video, then he tweeted, and then he tweeted something as if he was hacked. And it, oh, this was, yeah? yeah, and this was right when Kobe had- but He made a video. I mean, He made a video. I, mean. I know. <laughs> you know, and he was dropped by his agent. He was dropped by his manager. His yeah. shows were canceled. Was it opinion? distasteful? Yes. Was it deplorable in a lot of ways? I personally believe so. Do I think he shouldn't have done it? It's his form of comedy. But do I also think that if you do something or say something, you should be aware of the consequences? Yeah, that's yes. Exactly and that's, that's in any situation. If you're ready, whenever I take an action, I always say to myself, I am accountable and accepting of the benefits and the consequences of said action. Yeah. Well, do you think that there is anything that is off limits for a comedian? I do not think there's anything that's not, that, that, that is off limits for a comedian. I do, however, think that as a comedian, if you stay true to your brand, and as well as if you are creative enough, and it's okay to be aware and sensitive to other people, it's okay as long as it doesn't interfere with your true self. Yeah. And if that's your true self, then don't get upset when people don't like you. Right. That's also, if I, if I cook crap and I'm like, but I cooked it. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it tastes good, yeah. you know? That, that's how it works. So it, it's, it's a fine balance all the way around. So in case you guys didn't know, Iman and I have a lot of history in Washington, D.C. We used to date in high school. And to be honest, of course, so to be honest, Iman has his own brand, which I'm sure you're aware of. You've done very well in, in the event space. You've done a lot of wonderful events, but there was a time where we used to team up often and we've done a lot of amazing events. Now before me, Iman had Iman and Jimon. There was a time there was Iman and Jimon and that was a thing. Yeah. And though they did not know me that well, they disliked me. <laughs> because I was doing my own thing off brand. Uh, and so when Iman and I finally met, and this is why it's so important, if you, for everyone who hates people just for what they are, that's so stupid. When you meet them and you get to know who they are, you will hate them for who they are. You will dislike them. I hate Iman. But we teamed up and we, we've done a lot of amazing events in DC. We even had an event called, I love Tehran, I hate Tehran, yeah. I love Iman. I so we did, and this was one of our, and I'll take credit for this. It was one of our brilliant ideas where we promoted a party as if we were promoting against each other, yet it was the exact same party. And in fact, I remember one specific person had emailed Iman, not realizing it was coming to both of us, and was like, I'm so glad you're doing a party against Tehran, I hate that guy. A person who had never met me, 
I hate, I hate that guy. And Iman's like, yeah, I hate him too. By the way, the party's together. <laughs> we did the great George Mason Noru shows. We did Pretty shows much the, the last great one was us. We know. did a lot of stuff. I mean, we Warner Theater. Warner Theater, the rooftop, something that was very exclusive. You know, talk about your entertainment company. It was very exclusive to do something on the rooftop of the Warner Theater literally two blocks away from the White House where we were throwing parties where you could see the snipers staring over to see what was going on. And it was so good that imagine having all these amazing people in DC on a rooftop and it raining and no one leaving yeah. and partying in the rain we thought until it, gonna, it stopped. We thought it was gonna dampen the party but it actually took the party to a whole different level. A different level. And you know what I, what I really appreciated about um, those events that we did is that we truly brought a melting pot of people together. And together. That's, that is what I really missed uh, because from the outside, they would probably look at us too and they would never think that we can collaborate together because that's just how people judge books in general, sure. you know? But we really brought an incredible crowd together from all walks of life and it was super fun, man. It was, it was a big crowd, a great crowd and it was Persian people, non-Persian people, everybody. And that's what I love about DC the most is how much DC, in school we learned America's a melting pot. America's not a melting pot, America's salad. So there's lettuce, there's cabbage, there's tomato, whatever you put in salad, right? DC is a melting pot. It's all different people, all groups of people, all in the same place, and pretty much it flows. At times there are conflicts and sections and things, but for the most part, you get access to a lot of different groups of people. You can walk down the street, eat Ethiopian food, go up the block, get Persian food, go to the left, get you know, jumbo pizza, and then go to the right and have some borscht or whatever, you know? And you're just like, wow, all in one place. That's why we're all fat. Like, this is great. Yeah, see how fat you become. Dude. I know. Um, so listen, I, I know that right now on Mondays and Thursdays for about five, six years now, you've been hosting at the comedy, uh, at Laugh, the Laugh Factory, Factory, at the Laugh Factory. It's been seven years. Which is incredible. First the Laugh all, Factory, I mean. that's... The Laugh Factory is one of the best comedy clubs in, in the world. Number, that's not my opinion, that's just the truth. Laugh Factory, Comedy Store, I'm just lucky to be in a, in a place where I'm, I have access to all these amazing clubs and I've been at the Laugh Factory with the residency for the last seven years. Consistently, every Monday, every Thursday is my show. Monday's show is actually this mix of Persian and black people fusion, which is the longest running Middle Eastern show in America ever. And then Thursday show, I have a lot of headliners, but I give a lot. I also use the platform to give time to people who might not ever have access yeah. to the Laugh Factory or have been able to perform there. Right. So Laugh Factory, Jamie Masada, the owner, has been very gracious in, in allowing me this opportunity. And I took the opportunity. You remember how hard it was when I first started? Yeah. I was flying back and forth. If it wasn't for Virgin America and, <laughs> and a couple of things that just fell my way, yeah. You know? Ever since Richard Branson shot off Virgin, man, it really screwed everything yeah. Vir up. But Virgin right. America was the best like, airline you ever. It. You made it before the band came. Yeah, oh my God. Um, but so obviously you've done amazing stuff in the last seven years, and I'm so proud of you as a friend. Um, where, where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years? What are, what are, what are Tehran's I mean, goals? I'm gonna have to give the Matthew McConaughey answer and say, I wanna be me in five years, you know? Like, <laughs> I wanna be me in 10 years. Hopefully, the, the ultimate goal is to be Kevin Hart, Adam Sandler, Chappelle. That's the hope. But anywhere you, you aim for the you aim for the stars and land on the moon, right? So hopefully I get somewhere. My career has been growing significantly as, as I've been going. And it's just it's just a fun ride. I'm just there's a a, a, a poem in Farsi. Remember the flight, the bird is mortal. And that's how I'm just ex enjoying the journey, man. That's I'm ex amazing. on the experience. Well, I, I know you're gonna continue to soar to high places, man. I appreciate you making time for this walk with me segment. And I can't wait to see you in higher levels, brother. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. Love you, Yo. Take care.